Good evening, I'm Graham Kennedy. Ken Sutcliffe and I usually bring you the news, but not tonight. Stuart Wagstaff is with me. Stuart, is there any news fit to see on this Wednesday evening, the 9th day of November 1988? Graham, tonight, Prime Minister Bob Hawke welcomes the election of George Bush as President of the United States. A Franciscan monk burns rubber at the Adelaide Grand Prix, and the former schoolgirl companion of Bill Wyman takes up rock and roll. Hi, Jingo Stewart. She's grown up, hasn't she? Ooh, She's what? not 13 anymore. She was 13 when Bill Wyman from the Rolling Stones yeah. first uh, said hello. Is that all? Truly. First 13. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. What did you think of the USA presidential election result? A bit boring, really. Boring. Yeah, one might say it was a case of the bland leading the bland. <laughs> bland I liked mm. it. Stu, I received a letter today, yeah. which I've had typed out for a matter of convenience. Of course, yes. From a woman who thinks you are really... We had lots of calls last night. Mm. Yes, but we're, we're going ahead with it anyway. Yeah. She <laughs> says, thank you for having Stuart Wagstaff on your show, as he's always been my favourite performer. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I've watched every appearance he's made on television. And every, I've even attended every performance of My Fair Lady. That means she's seen the show 1800 and... 1880 times, I My think, yes. God. Isn't that lovely? What an it's astonishingly wonderful. good taste she has. Yeah. Well, may, may, maybe we could ask her to come in and see the show here tomorrow night. Ah, now, we thought of that. We thought of that, but when we rang, the matron said that she was have, to have more shock treatment tomorrow. She might be allowed out <laughs> on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Ian Ross in the newsroom with the latest... Thanks, Graham. Stuart. Prime Minister Bob Hawke has welcomed the United States election results. Speaking in Melbourne tonight, Mr Hawke says Australia will benefit greatly from George Bush in the White House. The Prime Minister was in Melbourne to address the pulp and paper industry's annual dinner at the Melbourne Zoo. He told the waiting media the US presidential election result was great news for Australia. Mr Hawke says George Bush is a close personal friend of his and he'd been quick to send him a congratulatory telegram. I think from Australia's point of view, uh, it will be uh, uh, a good thing because he, he's been to Australia, he knows us well, he thinks well of us, he knows the region well. Mr Hawke says George Bush has a high regard for Australia and he's confident there'll be close personal relations between him and the new president in the future. However, it's clear the Prime Minister has doubts about the way the Americans run elections. Not too bloody long. <laughs> Melinda Ogden for Graham Kennedy's news show. A dramatic day at Queensland's Fitzgerald inquiry after a politician told how he'd been ripping off the public purse for years. Former Queensland Cabinet Minister Don Lane confessed to using tens of thousands of dollars to buy personal items such as alcohol, flowers for his wife and restaurant bills. He said using ministerial expenses was common practice amongst Cabinet members. A 33-year-old fisherman is recovering in Rockhampton Hospital tonight, the only survivor of a traumatic shipwreck off the northeast coast of Queensland. After sending a mayday call on the weekend, James Cokeham was found by helicopter late yesterday. Both his brother and father, who were fishing with him, are believed to have been taken by sharks. They, they were just taken. That's all James could tell us. Uh, the sharks were there the whole time, nudging the boat. Doctors at Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital say they'll continue heart transplants despite the death of a 16-year-old recipient after a 19-hour struggle for life. The boy was Melbourne's second heart transplant patient. And a shop assistant protest marched through Sydney today, a demonstration against the state government's new extended shopping hours. The protesters, including a not-so-cheery Santa, packed the town hall, then marched on Parliament House, where a meeting was scheduled for next week. Emma Rossi, reporting for Graham Kennedy's news show. And I'll be back a little later in the show. Australian television history went under the auctioneer's hammer in Melbourne today, as more than 20 years of props, costume, scenery and memorabilia from Crawford Productions passed into the hands of enthusiastic buyers. Any advance of 275, army searchlights, 300, 300 on bid, 300 here. 325, having trouble with the police helicopter, are you? They sold for $325, but what would you do with them? About as useful as this army truck. At 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, your bid. All done! Cheap, you say. It was from a TV series called Alice to Nowhere, and it's going nowhere fast. It has no engine. Equally difficult to manoeuvre, this World War II raft. 
Here's the bid here. All done, all out, all silent. 375, sold. Bidding number, well done, sir. There were lots of boys who obviously wanted to play soldiers. At 240, wants to start his own army at 240. At 250. But it was a piece of the Sullivans most people were after. Mrs. Jessop's dining setting. Go to sell them, be quick, at $250, $250. Ten pairs of her shoes sold for $17. And someone wants to play dress-ups. I ended up buying a suit that Tom wore and a suit that, uh, what's his name, John wore also. But most keenly sought after was Kitty Sullivan's wedding dress. Joe Hall reporting for Graham Kennedy's news show. Oh, I think that's sweet. It's not quite MGM auctioning off mm -hmm. Judy Garland's red slippers, is it? But no, it's indeed. Mrs. Jessop's shoes getting 200. I think it's rather it's sweet. Imelda Marcos revisited it, isn't yes. it? Yes, well, yes. yes. <laughs> they, perhaps they, to get a better price, they should have thrown Mrs. Jessop in too. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about we were talking about acting last night, mm. Student, You said that you you you've been here for th you came to Australia 30 years ago. That's right. As a young British actor. Mm. That struck me as a bit odd. Why? I mean, well, why? <laughs> no, I liked the first why. <laughs> why? <laughs> I, in those days, it was the thing, what mostly happened was Australian actors went to London, but you did the reverse. Yeah, well, you see, that was one of the reasons I came here, because there were so many Aussie actors working in London, I thought there must be tons of vacancies here, and happily I was right. Who were some of the Australian... Name some of the Australian actors making their mark in London. Oh, there was Peter Finch, Peter your Finch. friend Leah McKern, yeah, McKern, Alan White, and, of course, the wonderful Coral Brown, who was originally from Melbourne. She was already very well established. Coral Brown, her. wonderful actor. There's some wonderful stories about her, most of which are not repeat repeatable. But Have you got one that is re my... re re repeatable? It's <laughs> <laughs> easy for you to say. Yeah, yeah I wish it were. <laughs> my favourite of hers is when she was just starting, and, and she was just starting as a leading lady and yes. making her name, and a young actor joined the company at rehearsal, and she said to him, what's your name, young man? And he said, Edward Woodward. She said, Edward Woodward? It sounds like a fart in a bath. <laughs> We've had the singing nun, the flying nun, and now we've got the motor racing monk. Ken Sutcliffe is in Adelaide to tell us about him. Hello, Ken, how are they hanging? <laughs> <laughs> Much the same as they've always done, Graham. Oh, good. <laughs> no difference, the altitude hasn't done anything. Oh, good work. Yeah, well... Uh, we miss you terribly. Yes, I, uh, I believe that uh, you had a lot of phone calls for Stuart and they said, don't come back. No, no, that's not true. Oh, that's not it? true. They said we are enjoying Stuart at the moment, yeah. uh, but we would like to see uh, Mr Honker himself come back to us. <laughs> <laughs> and your eyes are gorgeous too. Yes, thanks a lot. <laughs> they run in our family. You, you look like a surgeon ready to sort of cut something. That's because I've, I've got these on. I'm told I don't need to have these, Ken. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Well, that's good. Oh, I can leave them off. Throw the, you'll be able to walk now. <laughs> no, I I'm swear I heard then that I'll be able to walk now, you said. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like sort of throwing the crutches away. So oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, why don't you throw your crutch into the story then? All right. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to wait until Friday morning here in Adelaide to see the Formula One speedsters at the track, but already there's been some pretty competitive driving and practice for one of Sunday's other big events, the Celebrity Challenge. There'll be stars from the music industry, medalists from the Seoul Olympics, and if uh, he gets through the qualifying rounds, a most unlikely competitor, a Franciscan monk from Melbourne. In Adelaide, city of churches, he's become known as the Motor Monk. Brother Felix D. Chapman has come out of the friary for a week of fantasy. And it began with a dose of reality. Well, the first day of practice I learnt that I couldn't drive. And that's hardly surprising, really, because not only has Brother Felix never been to a racetrack, but in the 38 years he's been a Franciscan friar, he's never owned a car. I own nothing. I haven't got any money of my own, you know, and I couldn't go up to the boss and say, well, can I have, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Being car mad and then going without one for 38 years is a sacrifice motor racing fans can appreciate. And it's why this week is so special. And he's a bit of a petrol head. Brother Felix works in a Franciscan printery outside Melbourne and swapped his habit for a $900 fire suit by way of a competition conducted by Nissan. The idea was to send in a coupon. How many did you send in? 100. I'm keen. 
<laughs> His name was the last of four drawn, and he must outrace the others over the next few days to join the likes of marathoner Lisa Martin and surfer Mark Warren in Sunday's race. So for a week, Brother Felix will play with a $28,000 Nissan Exa, pay nothing for meals and accommodation, and generally lead anything but a monastic life. And for once, he's not quite sure God is in the passenger seat. Oh, I don't know about that. I think God's got out, out after the first lap, I think. <laughs> Too scared. Yeah. Tim Sheridan for Graham Kennedy's news show. Brother Felix. Ken, did you know that back at the monastery, Brother Felix works in the kitchen? I suppose he's the head friar. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, Ken, he's the chip monk. Oh, <laughs> Ken, I hope you have a lovely time in South Australia. Are you being mobbed? No, but they, they, they say hello and they all say, where is uh, the king? They want, want to see you down here and they're disappointed that you wouldn't come to the Grand Prix, but I said maybe next year. Yes. But uh, it's been the terrific. I mean, as you know, the Adelaide figures have always been very, very good. Well, tonight we're going to tell everyone later how good they were. Oh, yeah. This particular week, because we won everywhere. Uh, it wasn't touch and go in Sydney this week, as it quite often is. We won everywhere. Congratulations to you, Ken. We'll see you later. You too, mate. Stuart, I think it's your turn. Yes, it is. Good to see Ken, wasn't it? Wasn't it nice? Mm -hmm. To thousands of managing directors right across the country, their right-hand man is usually a woman. A good secretary is hard to find and even harder to hold on to. So, oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. No, I was watching Ken getting undressed in the other monitor. <laughs> I will try and forego that. Can we... Oh, I'm sorry. So, I ask you... Oh, I, I beg ask, your pardon. That's all right. No, any time. We're talking about secretary. I'll have a gin and tonic. Secretary's being hard to... <laughs> oh, <laughs> secretaries are very hard to hold. Where the devil are my slippers? <laughs> <laughs> where the devil are my... Eliza, where the hell are those bloody slippers? That's the end of My Fair Lady. Stuart leans back in the chair, puts the hat on, nods off. Wonderful scene. Hasn't for a few years, but still. Stuart, this is going to be difficult. We're so talking would you about... like to start again? Yes. All right. Oh, let's, Gail, let's start again. Whip it back, A love. good secretary <laughs> to thousands of managing directors yes. right across the country, yes. their right-hand man is usually a woman. Good. Anyway, got that? Yes. A woman, a good secretary... A wo good have you se got a it? Good se no. <laughs> I want you to have it. A good... I've not reason. A good, a good secretary is hard to find and even harder to hold on to. Oh, yes. Yes. So what does it take <laughs> I to be a know. secretary to the famous? What a lot of fuss over nothing. Yes. <laughs> Listen, if we got the Environment Minister, we should have him about quarter past seven, right? Should be no problem. Double check, but it looks good. Right. Well, she's my right-hand person. I mean, she, she keeps me in line, on track. I think she runs my life, probably, my wife's life as well. What I want you to do is ring them and talk to them for me. She's doing, in my case, half of my work. The um, decision, I think, will have to rest in their hands, finally. It's very much a team, team relationship. An expensive car is showy, a huge office, a status symbol, a cellular phone, convenient. But a top secretary is simply a must. I don't think they rely on them too much. Um, I think if your boss relies on you a great deal, it's just his way of showing that he really has faith in your ability. Val Style from the Secretaries Association says flexibility is the key to making a mark in the secretarial world. And you do have to have the right attitude. I think that attitude means that if someone asks you to make a cup of coffee, you make it and you do it well. 2GB News Talk 87. We know what we're talking about. It also appears they know how to pick secretaries. Take Lisa Joseph. In her job, flexibility is a must. Let's face it, could you work for this man? Coming up, uh, the Gough Whitlam TV commercials. And for that matter, Malcolm Fraser is, uh, you know, uh, doing ads as well. Love them. Or hate them. Breakfast man Mike Carlton has very definite ideas of what makes a good secretary. Brains. Above all, I don't care what they look like, even what they sound like all that much, as long as they're smart. And she is. I think that the role a secretary takes in any office is probably one of the most important positions if she's sensible. From typing to production work, Lisa does it all from dawn. She researches on the program. I mean, she may find herself ringing the Premier or the Treasurer or somebody in New York, whatever. Considering her responsibilities, is she fairly paid? She's paid with astonishing generosity. <laughs> uh, probably not, no. Maybe, she, maybe she'll give her a rise, yeah. Harry M has been lucky. He's had to find only three secretaries in his working life. But when the search is on, 
What does he look for? The ability to catch on quickly, because finally, if you have a good secretary, she sort of knows what you're thinking. And so when you say, get the what's-his-name from there, she brings it. Quite a tough job at times, believe me. <laughs> I don't have wrinkles like this for nothing, you know. <laughs> Graham, I've always been aware of the importance of a good secretary. Oh, you know, yeah. the very first day I entered a television studio, the station manager told me that he always slept with a secretary by his bed in case anything came up during the night. Yes. <laughs> no, that is fascinating. I liked Harry there saying uh, I liked his remarks. Mm. John Singleton, the king of Ocker advertising, was born on this day in 1941. His campaigns are built on aggressive Australianism, showing Aussies and their lifestyles as they really are. His current ads, for example, involve putting elephants in swimming pools. And why not? They've got their trunks on. <laughs> Despite being a squillionaire, he masterminded the campaign for the Labour Party in the recent New South Wales state election. They lost. He was formerly married to Belinda Green, Australia's entrant in the Miss World competition. She won. Albert Watson Newton and Patricia McGrath were married at St Dominic's Church in Camberwell on this day in 1974. A crowd of well-wishers estimated at 10,000 gathered outside the church. The best man was an obscure television personality. <laughs> and I'm very pleased to announce that Bert and Patty are still together. And so is the best man. In the School of Television, we get our report cards on Wednesday. It's just like being at school, isn't it, in this business? I guess it is, You've been yes. a good boy, you've been a bad boy. And we have a report card that we call them the ratings. If it's a bad report, you get yelled at. Mm. Sometimes they even make you stand in the corner at the unemployment office. However, I'm happy to tell you that we didn't get yelled at today. In fact, we passed with flying colours and went straight to the head of the class. An enormous win for the Nine Network in Sydney, with the Bond flagship taking the week by more than seven points. In Melbourne, it was another victory to Nine, with ten second and seven third. Sharing honours as Sydney's most popular program was Brian Henderson's National Nine News and the Comedy Company. In Melbourne, another tie with National Nine News and Hey Hey It's Saturday taking the title. A definite trend on the flop front is Network 10's do-gooder series Sable, continuing to do no good at all in either Sydney or Melbourne. Nine's stranglehold on this week's Sydney figures were also reflected on the movie front, with the survey's three most popular films all being shown on Channel 9. Karate Kid 2 and Just One of the Boys held on to the top two spots in the Melbourne market. The late afternoons have developed into a neck-and-neck -neck struggle between Wheel of Fortune and Live at Five. In Sydney, weekly averages give it to the Seven Network Game Show, just ahead of Joe Pearson and Terry Willisey, with the game show format holding on to pip Live at Five again in the second half hour. In Melbourne, it was the same close-fought battle, with the game show on Seven taking the first half hour, with Live at Five fighting back to take the second half. News time is definitely Brian Henderson time in Sydney. Averages show National 9 News 10 points clear of 7 nightly news, with Channel 10 a long way back in third spot. In Melbourne, Brian Naylor's National 9 News took the honours from 10 and 7. On Sunday nights, Comedy Company is still the clear winner over 60 minutes, widening the gap it held in Sydney last week. In Melbourne, however, the difference was only 3 points, with 7 miles back in third spot. In the late night battle, the King is definitely back on top in Sydney, peaking at a tremendous 14 and averaging almost nine for every quarter hour of the show. In Melbourne, the figures were even better, with Graham Kennedy's news show averaging more than 10, double that of its news world opposition. Well, congratulations. Thank you so splendid. much, old chap. I'll Very kind of you I'll to drop in. I'll soon ruin that. Look at next week's yes. rating. Wait yeah. till we see next Wednesday. <laughs> All back standing in the corner. Just a few <laughs> years ago, <laughs> the media had a field day with the shock horror story of the Rolling Stone and the schoolgirl. That's right. Bill Wyman, his name was, and he took this 13-year-old girl, <laughs> 13, Mandy Smith, he took her out to dinner. It proves he's not superstitious, doesn't mm. it? Took out, did it? And it was very embarrassing because he had to ask the waiter which wine 
went well with Vegemite. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like Close Encounters of the Third Grade. Yes. Bill, Bill is fond of young ones. As a matter of fact, he dumps them as soon as their faces clear up. <laughs> Five years ago, at the tender age of 13, Mandy Smith grabbed worldwide attentions when she admitted she'd had a relationship with middle-aged Rolling Stone Bill Wyman. Whilst the ensuing scandal gave Wyman a couple of headaches, for Mandy Smith, the publicity and notoriety made her an instant celebrity. After commanding reported fees of up to $1,000 a minute as a model, Mandy has turned her attention to pop music. What do you say to those critics who claim that the only reason that you're famous is because of your association with Bill Wyman? I can understand what you're saying, but at the same time, I think if people put two and two together, um, it, it's not such a good idea. I mean, I didn't do that anyway, but it, it's not a good idea for that because I started modelling when I was 13. I had my own career started, so why should I do something that would make it adverse, that wouldn't work for me? I have no regrets in my life, and I don't have to um, ever put the story right because it's my private life and everything I do to me, I keep private. And I don't feel that I have to explain to anybody what I've done, because nobody else does. Mandy Smith is the latest artist produced by the now legendary Stock Aitken Waterman production team, the people who gave Kylie worldwide recording success. I think they give the kids what they want, you know, they know what the sort of music the kids like, even though I think people tend to knock, knock them now because they're so successful. It's like, oh, stock egg and water again, but they really do put a lot of input into the charts. How do you take that sort of criticism when people say, oh, she's just a, a good-looking lady who's uh, gone into the studio and sang a song that someone else has written and produced? Well, I think everybody's got to start somewhere, and I think a lot of people in the business do you start like that? Well, I'd say in my case, I know a lot of people that started like that, because we all have to start somewhere, but at least I'm working with good people, which can encourage me and help me for the future. And then I can write my own material and hopefully sort of work on my own stuff. I think really people have to accept me as me and try and find out my character, because I think people only know character of me through the press which is a bit of a shame because I don't really think they have portrayed me in a nice way. She doesn't really sing that well, does she? Who cares? I mean, <laughs> she has that certain indefinable something that only young, nubile blondes with great norks have. <laughs> Updating tonight's news, Prime Minister Hawke welcomes the US presidential result. Mr Hawke says George Bush has a high regard for Australia and knows the region well. And the Prime Minister is confident of close personal ties with the new president. A major breakthrough in the Fitzgerald inquiry after a Queensland politician confessed he'd plundered the public purse for years. Former Cabinet Minister Don Lane said he and some of his colleagues used expense accounts for personal items. Our next Governor-General, Bill Hayden, got some valuable practice tonight, opening an art exhibition in Melbourne. He couldn't contain his irreverent style, however, joking about the ABC cutting short a program about him. I'm going to stop this, I? There's going to be a little trouble, I'm going to be sombre. And that's all from the newsroom. Now it's back to the studio. Ian Ross bringing us up to date. Scotland's Gordon Brand Jr. has taken a four-stroke lead after the first round of the South Australian Golf Championship at Adelaide's Grange Course. Brand shot a sizzling six under par 64 to lead by four strokes from Wayne Grady, Robert Stevens, and American Jack Larkin all tied at two under. West Indies got their first taste of the SCG, getting in a three-hour practice session this morning in preparation for their match against New South Wales on Friday. While the Windies batting has been solid on tour, Captain Viv Richards has some concerns with his youthful bowling lineup. They're young guys and I'm quite certain, you know, that as the, the series and the matches do progress, you know, that these guys, you know, will most certainly come into their own. The Windy side to take on the Blues will be announced tomorrow night. Meanwhile, Brisbane's chances of holding the equestrian events may have taken a tumble after this fall in race five at Bundamba. 
But Idle Cadet is coming after him quickly. There's one down, there's two down. La Bellicose came down hard on the turn into the straight. And another Fortunately, the GGs were only bruised. The jockeys escaped with concussion and lived to ride another day. Luckily for punters, all finished in the Bendigo Cup today, the first $100,000 event ever run on a Victorian country track. The favourite was Bronze Knight, but it was Batuta who caused the upset. Bronze Knight tackled by Batuta and Jolly Good Thought. Batuta, Batuta takes the lead in the cup and it's Batuta for the Bendigo Cup. David Peters for Graham Kennedy's news show. You've never asked how I started off in this business, Stuart? No, I haven't. I've read it many times, of course. Have you? Oh, yes. What does it Nikki say? Nicky and all that. In I started off as a radio. And... Well, actually, I started off running the news. I was only running a little boy. Running the news? Running. You mean running it in your hand? Running with a news bulletin in the hand. Yes. From the ABC newsroom in the older fleet building in Collins Street, where the Menzies at Rialto is now, mm -hmm. I would run from there up two blocks and take it to the newsreader in Radio Australia, which hey. was behind the ABC in those days on the corner of Lonsdale. Is this grabbing you? Um, on the corner of Lonsdale and uh, William Street. Yes, Melbourne. Run, I would... Yes, in Melbourne. Mm. Run, run. Well, I couldn't have run it all the way up here, Stuart. You, could, you were fit. I wasn't, I wasn't mm. a bad little 17-year-old fitness person. Mm. But that's how I, and I would thrust the, the news, the, the, the radio announcer at Radio Australia would glare at me because the editor had given it to me late and I ran as fast as I could, but he wouldn't have time to read it first. Who would have thought I'd be running with it and then reading it? Exactly. Uh, and I, I, I one of the announcers was Ronald Coleman's brother, Eric Coleman. I remember that. He, he died in mm. Melbourne. Well, lot of us have died in Melbourne. I did once at the Princess. No, you didn't. What are you? <laughs> High spirits. Oh, yes. Great was, misnomer. Yes, yeah, mm. that's the adaption of Blythe Spirit, isn't With it? With music. And it wasn't too good. Perhaps it was the production. It did it work production. elsewhere. Telephone calls as a result of last night's telecast. Oh, oh, yes. Our viewer has lost admiration for GK because he is condoning porno movies. I don't think I s condoned. I said that I believed you should be able to do whatever you wanted to do if you sure, wanted to watch. Sure one of those movies in your own house and so long as you weren't playing it to children i felt if you wanted to do that that's all right is Absolute, that absolutely. is that condoning it possibly hardly isn't. hardly good to see stuart back oh my god Thank here you. we go there's that's hundreds right. of these good to see stuart back when only the best will do mm. 12 highly complimentary calls about stuart he is indeed suave urbane witty and similar adjectives plus one noun <laughs> Would you please replay the Dame Edna section as a couple of fans from Melbourne missed it? Of course. Would you like it now or in half an hour's time? Is there a movie you'd like us to put on for you? <laughs> Stupid cretins. <laughs> a viewer asks, can he fax his caption entry in? No, you can't. It must come via Australia Post. Eleven callers. Mm -hmm. Asking when is the caption competition being drawn next week? You've told them that. A I was, times. Yes, I know, but they people tune in and out. I mean, you don't. We like to think they go. Oh golly, it's ten yes. thirty. We must watch and listen. But the phone rings. People have to go to the lavatory, put Make on the kettle, tea, yes. and they don't watch everything. Like every night, they every night since the competition, people have rung and said, "What's the address for the competition?" Even though we show it every night, mm. you've got to watch. I can't help you if you don't watch. A man called from Brisbane watches Graham Kennedy News show every night, really enjoys it, but he didn't like Graham's comments on Aborigines. What was that? Tonight. I don't remember. I didn't do the one about... No, the... I'm sure he didn't. No. <laughs> no. Oh, I said, no, no. It was in the weather last night, I said... Yes, an Aboriginal lady... ...that we normally got our... She wasn't there because she was in Canberra playing the poker oh, machines. Did... What's wrong with that? Oh, aren't people picky? Very picky. Yes. Caption competition address, 11 calls you must watch. Oh, here we go. I love Stuart, four calls. I might vomit. No calls. <laughs> <laughs> Our apologies and sympathy, and I must say condolences to the families of the 18 stockbrokers who committed suicide last night after watching our finance report. We're very sorry. The decimal point should have been two places to the right. <laughs> At the close of trading, the old ordinaries were marginally higher. The U.S. elections have continued to influence the Nikkei Dow, but the FT100 is relatively untouched. The Australian dollar is selling at 83.48 U.S. cents, and gold has fallen $3.
Can you supply a caption for this cartoon that matches the one I invented? Look at it. There's a horse. There's a man bringing the horse in, and the man on the right is not terribly happy about it. On the wall are some paintings. That's all the clues you need for my caption. When you do have a caption, write it on the back of an envelope with your own name and address. That is on the back of it. We're having such trouble. Really? People forget to put their either their name or their caption on the back of the envelope. Don't put anything in the envelope either. That's it. We don't open them. Then put our address on the front. That is our address. Post Office Box 566 Willoughby, New South Wales, 2068. Doesn't matter where you're watching in Australia. If you are the winner, you get everything. You do. It's the most wonderful prize. You get the exciting Akai VS A77 video recorder. Not only that, and it's for, I've got one at home, I've been playing with it all day, also the VCR, and it, no, it truly is fantastic. Tapes that I didn't know were in quad, like uh, well, so many movies. Today I was playing Linda Ronstadt yes. in concert. I, and I thought it was too old to have the information on the tape. But no, there it is, all around you. Isn't that amazing? And uh, not just videos, but when you're watching television. In fact, it occurred to me today, now that these machines are available, television sound engineers or television stations generally will have to start thinking about that market. Of course. Because not everything that comes out is correct. Like Live at Five, for instance, is not surround, not but quite? the commercials are in Live at Five. We are in, we are in surround. Yes. Nice Ray, our audio man, has us coming through the main speakers and the audience at the back. Isn't it's quite fascinating. I don't even understand radio. I have no idea how that works. No, I don't either, Stuart. Mm. I, we won't go into it, I All don't right. think. I, as I, I've never known how the, the sound got out of the grooves <laughs> on a 78. Why is that funny? No, I've never known. I, I don't know anything about that. Cat's whiskers, I started with. We, 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 had, a, uh, we had a crystal set. Did you? You had to find the right spot That's on right. the crystal. That's right. Tickle it. That's right. Yes. I still have the same... <laughs> yeah, we won't go to We that. won't go to that. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the Akai, Warner Brothers will send you some videos, more than 20 of them, so that you will be able to watch. The out-of-survey period is soon upon us. You'll be able to have a lovely time for at least three weeks if you watched a movie every night. The weather, and we've just received uh, a letter from the Outback, Stuart, telling us how dry it is there, and it must be dry. Look, the stamp has been stapled on. <laughs> <laughs> Townsville can expect a fine day with a low of 20 and a high of 31. In Brisbane, a pleasant warm day with temperatures between 15 and 27. Cloudy in Sydney, 16 to 22. For Perth, a fine hot day, 15 to 34. Also fine in Hobart, but cooler, 10 to 19. Canberra becoming fine, 10 to 21. For Adelaide, a sunny day, 11 to 22. In Melbourne, dry and clear, 10 to 20. And for Darwin, a late storm with temperatures between 26 and 33. We were... Oh, I've just been handed a late item. I always thought you just pretended that. No, no, no real, it really it? does happen. Has this been checked? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't your turn. <laughs> How many sources? One! Name it. Black bean! Black bean. Black bean. Racist. Yeah. Complaints about that. Racist. <laughs> In Perth, Dr... Just a moment. A star is talking. <laughs> Don't believe I said twinkle, that. Twinkle, twinkle. <laughs> In Perth, Dr Derek Standing is facing charges for his unsympathetic attitude to one, towards one of his patients. He visited him at his bedside and said, do you want the good news or the bad news? I think I know this later. <laughs> On asking for the bad news first, the patient was told that he only had two days to live. Oh. The patient said, oh my God, what's the good news then? And the doctor said, you see that blonde nurse over there <laughs> whose legs go right up to her chin? The one with the huge mammary glands. <laughs> well, I'm taking her to surface for the weekend. That's the good news. Good night. <laughs>